So back in 1977, Byte Magazine declared three computers the trinity of computing at the time. The TRS-80 Model 1, the original Apple II, and the Commodore PET. And since I never had the chance to play with a Commodore PET when I was a kid, I get two today. Welcome to Vintage Geek. I'm Aaron, welcome to Vintage Geek. And you know, ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to mess with a Commodore PET computer. It was listed as one of the three major computers back in the early days in 1977. Now the story is, from what I've read online, that the actual founders of Commodore had the chance to buy the Apple II from Steve Jobs, but decided not to because the price point was just a little bit too high. They wanted to build their own system, and their marketing director had actually just seen marketing for the PET Rock and made some comment about, if some people are dumb enough to buy a pet rock, why don't we just call it a pet computer? Then later, they actually created the acronym that fit it, which was Personal Electronic Transactor. I never had a chance to mess with a Commodore pet computer when I was young. The only experience that I even have with a pet was in my elementary school computer lab. They had an older computer lab that hadn't been used for a while, and in that lab had things like the TRS-80 Model 3, and I do recall that they had a PET 2001, similar to this unit that we have here, that actually has the cassette player and the cash register type interface in it. I'm anxious to get to play with these. We found these from different sources over time. Um, I think actually all of these were uh, various marketplace finds. We have only power on tested these machines, so I'm gonna take a chance today to really play with one of these, maybe write a program, load a couple of programs off of a cassette, and see what happens. Do want to mention really quick though, that our third Commodore PET computer, the one over here, has a broken CRT. That actually happened in shipping, but when we received it, we weren't sure what that pattern on the screen really meant. We had to do a little bit of interesting testing to really uh, kind of narrow that one down. It almost looks like oxidation or some kind of dirt. But I have some concerns because I've been told about monitors that implode and other things that happen with monitors. I'm not super excited about just turning this thing on with the possibility of something blowing up without it being in a somewhat safe situation. And I figured putting it outside facing away from us when we turn it on would be a good move in that direction. So what I've done is I've got a one of these Walmart light control remote control outlets, basically for Christmas lights. It's off currently. I'm gonna plug in the pet. Here goes nothing. That doesn't sound great. I saw a little bit of green light in the very bottom of the CRT, almost like there was some kind of current passing through it. It did not look like a normal CRT behavior though. It definitely doesn't sound like it. It did not explode. <laughs> One of the things I'm excited about testing today is the fact that we do have one, and exactly one, Commodore PET branded cassette with an original program, and it's got squiggly and big time on it, so I'm uh, anxious to see what those programs are like. We even have some paperwork that shows you the full program listing for these, so I suppose if the cassette doesn't read, I could type it in manually, but it, it may take a long time with that cash register type keyboard. In any case, let's get into it. So I think it would be appropriate to start today's pet experimentation with the PET 2001-8. This is the one that has the built-in cassette recorder as well as the cash register style keyboard that a lot of people really didn't like. So we're going to try this first as it's the earliest pet that we have. It's time to start our official pet project here at Vintage Geek. I'm getting ready to turn on this PET 2001 series now. This is the first time that I've actually turned on this machine at all, so uh, let's see what happens. Well, that was pretty quick. Got uh, Commodore Basic, 7,167 bytes free, and uh, actually a pretty nice looking display on this computer. It's very clean, very crisp, and we got our flashing cursor. I was told by the owner of this particular pet that the cassette drive, he actually did replace the belt in this cassette drive, which is great uh, because apparently that was a problem in these. I'm gonna go ahead and rewind this. I believe that we have to simply type in load big time. I cannot touch type on this. This keyboard is truly terrible. Press play on tape number one. Okay. Searching for big time. I read that the tape machine on these were about 700 baud, which means about 700 bits per second. 
which is very slow. So this may take a little while, and I'm not sure if Big Time is the second program on the cassette, which will take even longer because then it has to actually get past the squiggle program to load the Big Time program. I will say again though that the, the display on the Commodore PET looks great. It's very crisp. The cassette deck that's internal to the unit seems to be working well. It's got good motion, it's not making a lot of extra sounds or noises, so apparently that belt replacement must have been the right one. Well, I'm beginning to wonder if it's going to load this or not. So I decided just to verify, since we've never tested this tape, I just want to see if there's any actual data on the tape. We can do that by just listening to a standard cassette player. I brought out a Tandy one just because it has a speaker. But just so we can hear if we hear the data tones on the tape, just in case it was erased at some point. All right, so there's definitely data on this tape but for whatever reason, the Commodore PET is not interpreting it. So we did get with this PET an actual C2N data set unit. This was the same cassette unit used for pretty much all the Commodore computers from what I understand. But we're gonna try plugging this into the PET that we have here just to see if it will load this tape. Press play on tape number two. We're searching for squiggle. Ah, found squiggle, loading. Hmm. Load error, okay. Well, if we hit load again, I wonder if it will let us load big time because that would be the second program. We're searching for big time. If we get to the point where it says found monitor again, we've gone too far. Yeah, it found monitor. So it, the big time program is just not even being found at all on this cassette. I'm not really sure why. So overall, not a huge success with the first incarnation of the PET 2001-8. What we're going to try now is we're going to set this one aside we're going to go to the slightly later model 2001 with the better keyboard and more memory because we actually do have a boxed game for that system that needs the 32K, which this one does not have, but the later model does. So we should be able to do a little bit more with it. We do happen to have some actual boxed games that play on the PET, or at least they say they do. These are from a company called Avalon Hill, and we have a number of these. This one's called Shootout at the OK Galaxy. It looks like it's an arcade type shooter. It will run on a PET with as low as 8K. So technically we could have run this on the first PET. Didn't realize that at the time, but uh, we're gonna try it on this PET 2001-32 and see if we can get it to load today. Uh, this game looks kind of interesting because on a recent video, we actually talked about a TRS-80 game. It looked very similar in its graphical presentation and it was called Project Nebula. So I'm curious as to what this one will look like if we can get it to play. All right, let's see if we can load this game. Found shootout one, loading. It's encouraging. Yeah, it says ready, so it did load the game. Now comes the moment of truth. We're gonna see what happens when we try to run the game. Oh, shootout, 1982, the Avalon Hill Game Company. Level of difficulty, gotta go with one. Red alert, 20 raider ships have entered your patrol zone. Oh no. I mean, the movement seems pretty good. It's pretty fluid. The screen has a lot of uh, clarity unlike the demonstration we did with the color computer where everything had kind of a lot of graininess. This is very clean. Controls though are a very weird place. Okay, so there's the fire button. There's obviously no sound. It's nice though that it shows you a numeric representation of the azimuth and the heading. And the movement seems great. Not sure what I'm supposed to be shooting at to be completely honest with you. Right now I'm just kind of moving around seeing if I can see something easy to shoot. All right, well overall the game does work and it looks pretty good on the screen. It's smooth, it's responsive. So reading the manual for this game, it's actually fairly in depth. Looks like there's an entire map and you're supposed to navigate through sectors finding these enemy ships. Oh, yeah, patrol zone, interesting. Wonder if you have to hold it down. Raider ships destroyed, zero. It says zone three, there's a patrol zone. It looks like it's a grid. You've got eight across and eight down. I assume that that plus sign is where there's an enemy ship, maybe? Well, if I move over... Oh, okay, so the heading is actually telling you where you're at. Movement. Your patrol zone is a rectangular area that is divided into sectors. Each sector is small enough to patrol in normal space. To move from one sector to another, you must enter hyperspace. In order to enter hyperspace, your vessel must be aligned on the galactic plane. Your azimuth must be set at zero. All right, azimuth is zero. You must point your vessel in the direction you want to travel in. To do this, modify your heading until it indicates you are pointing in the direction you want to travel in. A heading of four will move you to the left of the screen. Oh, wow. Traveling through hyperspace. Now the screen's all white with a black background. 
Oh, interesting. So apparently every time you jump in hyperspace, it costs energy units. Your shields may suffer damage. Uh-oh, looks like I think we're taking hits. Oh no, we're taking hits! We got an enemy somewhere. I think there's a good likelihood I'm gonna die here. Just throwing that out there. Well, this game clearly works, and uh, it does do all the things that it says that it does, but it looks like it's gonna require a learning curve. So we have another Avalon Hill boxed game here. Voyager 1, Sabotage of the Robot Ship. A new microcomputer role-playing concept, Voyager 1 puts you on board a spaceship infested with killer robots. You are the lone survivor of a human invasion strike sent upon an almost impossible mission. Sabotage and destroy the robot ship and its mechanical pirates and escape before the ship self-destructs. Honestly, it sounds pretty intense. I'm right, level 3, arrows to move through the levels. EL is elevator, RO is robot, LA is laser. Arrows to move. Doesn't look like this is drawing the actual maps properly. It's like it's trying to, but... Go to the map screen again. Yeah, there's something wrong about the way that the pet is interpreting this particular program. The map screen works as you would expect. All the logic is working. You can tell on the screen that the cursor is showing where the character is supposed to be. And I assume that the inside of the U is the direction that you're facing because I just turned... I think, left. I think we've confirmed that the the cursor keys do change their direction. And I'm assuming that shift is going to make like the cursor up, go up, and the normal non-shift version is down. Again, not 100% sure. The map version on this is working, but the actual display of the rooms is garbled. Um, that might be an issue with this particular ROM. It does mention in the book that you need to have a more modern ROM of the pet, but it did say that this was Commodore Basic version 4.0, so I actually don't know for sure. The part that it works looks great. It's very clean, but the actual gameplay itself is just kind of a garbled mess. Can't, can't really tell where anything is supposed to be or where anything is. I think maybe what we'll do is we'll try to code a quick program on the, uh, the pet, see where we can get with that. I haven't had to hunt and peck on a keyboard in a long time, but this one, the layout is so different that I can't, I really can't touch type. I'm also skipping all the rem commands that are listed in the book because it's already in the book. I don't really need to put it in the code for this purpose. All right, so after a lot of painstaking typing and using the hunt and peck method, I finally got all the lines of this original squiggle program that thankfully we had the actual documentation for to be able to uh, retype this all in. And I've got it all inputted. As you can see, if we list the program that's in memory, we can see all the wonderful lines that I've typed to make this happen. And uh, as I was going, I do kind of recognize what everything is doing here. We have a number of different loops that are basically moving particular characters around the screen. One of the things I like about the Commodore is the fact that it has all this alternate character set. If you look at the keys, each one of these keys has a different symbol on it that you can access by using the Shift key. And this made doing graphical things quite a bit easier and it makes it look very clear because there's an actual character for lines and bars and squares. And I think that's what this program is using a lot of. So let's see what happens when we run it. All right, so let's put in a wiggle factor of two. All right, so we've created some kind of a repeating pattern on the screen. I don't know if I would exactly call it a squiggle. It's possible that our data set in the beginning is not using the reverse characters, and maybe that's what's throwing it off. There are some special keys that are represented in kind of a reverse graphics on the actual text that actually mean other things. For example, the home key or the, the clear key to clear the screen, those show as characters when you print them out. So I was trying to actually put in the physical character representation instead of those keys, which was making a very weird pattern happen on the screen. I think that I've corrected all that now, so I'm going to try to run this program again and see if we've got an effective squiggler, as it were. I mean, it's kind of like a real early screensaver for Windows. <laughs> Just kind of have a wiggling line. Nothing's really meshing up. Like I said, I think I got the wrong character put in there for the horizontal bar. Something's going on because it's not really matching up, but I don't know. Setting it to 8, it is actually making a squiggly line, so, you know, I'll take that as a kind of win. Well, we've created and successfully run a program on the Commodore PET, so that's uh, one thing I can cross off my bucket list. 
So I found another mistake in the code that was making that kind of reverse video appearance for some of the lines and making it not line up. I just had the wrong character key for one of them. So I'm going to try this again one more time and see if I get a little bit better squiggle this time. Do a squiggle factor of six. Now see, that looks a little bit more on brand with what I would think it would be doing. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Got a little squiggling line moving around the screen. The lines are kind of matching up now, so it doesn't look as weird, which is great. Okay, all right, I'm pleased with that. At least it uh, seems to match what I'm seeing in the actual book. Not sure where that particular cursor marker came from, but you know, nothing's perfect. So as we continue our work with our Commodore PET, I thought it would be a great idea to try the original floppy drive that would have come with one of these units as well. We actually do have a CBM 4040, which is compatible with the PET units that we have. We're going to give this a try. Uh, I have never tested this disk unit, nor have I ever used a disk unit for a PET, so this should be an interesting experiment. Step one, open both disk drive doors and make sure that no disks are present in either drive. No disks in here? All right, we're good there. All right, step two, turn power onto the computer and verify that it's working properly. All right, everything looks good. We already know the PET works, as we did our tests earlier. Step three, apply power to the disk drive. The disk didn't flash twice. All the lights did come on and the motor ran, so the command seems to be working properly. Okay, device not present error. After much testing and much work, we do have a working floppy drive, albeit only one of the two drives in the drive unit is functioning properly. I thought maybe we could get drive zero to work by doing some cleaning. What we did is we actually took apart the case. We looked at the drive. I saw that the stepper motor was not working properly. The head was not moving with the stepper motor. So I went ahead and cleaned it up. There seemed to be some kind of residue on it. I don't know, it almost looked like something maybe had spilled in the chassis of the drive unit at some point. So I cleaned off the rails, put a little oil on it, put it back together. It's now actually making the head move when you initialize the drives, but no matter what I did, I could not get it to actually format a disk. Kept giving me a disk bad error. I'm not sure why. I'll settle for just having drive one working, which actually didn't work again after we, <laughs> we worked on drive zero. And then I had to reseat the connectors and clean a bunch of contacts and everything to get that working again. But we do have drive one. So what I'd like to do is take the program we wrote, our version of Squiggle, and actually save that to a floppy disk. Earlier when we were, wrote the Squiggle program, I was able to actually save that on a cassette using the Commodore C2N cassette machine. So I do have a copy of this on cassette. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load this into the PET, make sure it still runs properly. Then I'm gonna save that program to a floppy disk and then shut everything down, reopen it, see if I can reload that program. So we're gonna load from the tape. Found squiggle. That's good. All right, and we are ready. Let's make sure the program runs. All right, and we've got our working squiggle program. It loaded from cassette successfully. Let's stop that. We'll go ahead and clear the screen. And now we're going to save this program to the floppy. And uh, that seems like a much faster save time <laughs> than saving to the cassette. So now Let's take out the disk. We're going to go ahead and shut down the machine to make sure that it doesn't have anything in its memory. We're going to turn it back on. Again, it's going to initialize that floppy disk. Just to make sure, I'm going to hit run so that you can see there's nothing here. There's no, no program loaded. Now let's see if we can load from the floppy. Got to make sure we specify drive one. It's a really fast load time, especially compared to that cassette. Let's run it. And hey, we've got a successful squiggle program that we loaded from a floppy disk. So I thought it'd be fun to kind of conclude our pet project to have something unique on the pet, a little program that we can run specific to Vintage Geek. And uh, this actually took a little bit more work than I anticipated because uh, in the world of the Commodore pet, the only thing you can do graphically is using PetSki, which is basically the special characters on the front of the keys on the Commodore pet keyboard. And uh, you're limited to a certain number of symbols. Basically you have blocks that have either you know half circles or quarter circles or diagonal lines. So what I did to try to simplify this, and I assume a lot of people did at the time, is I made myself a little piece of graph paper uh, that had the 40 columns by the 25 rows that the pet screen has. And uh, I traced over the Vintage Geek logo by basically putting it behind here 
and roughly translating it with the Petsky characters that I could find that would fit. It took a little bit of experimentation and trial and error, but and there you have it, the Petsky version of the Vintage Geek logo. Just so you can see what the code listing looked like on that and how complicated it gets when you try to type in these Petsky characters. Here's what the actual program looks like. So as most adventures with all pets go, it's been a little bit uh, interesting today. We've been able to take a look at a couple of different pet models. The 2001-8, which was the one with the cassette recorder built in. This is the 2001-32, which is the 32K version. We also have the Commodore Pet Model 4016, which unfortunately was damaged in shipping. And as we showed you earlier, went through quite the adventure uh, testing that out before we uh, are eventually going to get that CRT replaced. I do have a few things to note that I thought were interesting about the experience. One is that the cash register style keyboard on the, the first version is absolutely terrible. I can understand why people would not have liked that and why there was a lot of aftermarket add-ons made for it. Secondly, when they did improve the keyboard, it's actually pretty good. Um, this particular machine has a couple of keys that are not registering right off the bat, so you kind of have to use a little bit more pressure, but it was decent to use. Other than the layout itself, which if you're used to a normal keyboard, uh, not having the numbers across the top row was a killer for me. Uh, I'm used to using numbers that way when I'm coding, so having to go back to the number pad and all of the special characters really kind of threw me for a loop, but once I got used to it, actually wasn't that bad. One of the things that I really liked about the way that it works is the fact that you can move the cursor around on the screen and actually edit lines of code that you've worked on previously without having to retype them. Some of the other systems that have early basic didn't allow that and uh, that made going back and changing things pretty easy. So overall, pleased with the pets that we have, the two working models. I think they're excellent candidates for the museum. We need to do a little bit more work on the cassette recorder on the first pet to make sure that it can load programs properly. But in the meantime, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this experiment today. If you like vintage computers, if you like what we're doing here on the channel, please like and subscribe. It's going to help us a lot as we move forward. We've got a lot of things that we're working on for the museum and for the YouTube channel, and uh, your support really helps us a lot. We very much appreciate it. In the meantime, we've got more videos to share with you as time goes on. So please stick around and enjoy Vintage Geek. Thanks for watching today.